Okay, hello YouTube. Uh, by request, we're going to be taking a look at the 150 attack. Um, that's an attack that you actually play against the perk. Uh, it could happen with bishop e3, or it could even happen with uh, pawn to f3. It's uh, basically the same idea. Uh, the first game we're going to actually be taking a look at is just going to be starting with the move uh, bishop, a bishop e3. And if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, uh, please hit that like button and please hit subscribe. So bishop e3 starting the... Uh, 150 attack is kind of a good idea because it does make it very difficult for black to play c5. Uh, really, just at any point after bishop e3, if black does decide to play pawn to c5, uh, white can usually just take it. So it kind of cuts down your preparation a little bit. And there's just not a ton that you have to prepare when you play this so-called uh, 150 attack. Now, if you don't know, the reason that the 150 attack gets its name is because it's sort of the type of an attack that a 150 British player uh, would play. And I don't know how the British rating system works, but I've been told that 150 is around 1800 USCF, so uh, basically it's what an 1800 would try to play against the perk. So one of the benefits of it is it does simplify your preparation. You can basically play about the same plan against just about any perk setup. Uh, I would break it down into a couple of different options for black to try to employ. Basically, black can try to uh, keep his king in the middle. Black can try to castle queen side. Uh, black can try to castle king side. And then black can make his decision on whether or not he wants to play an early e5 or whether or not he wants to do some sort of early expansion on the queen side with uh, c6 and uh, b5. And, you know, basically that's what's going on in this position. So this first game that we're going to take a look at is a really famous one. It's called Kasparov's Immortal Game. Um, it was Gary Kasparov versus Vasilin Topolov, uh, played in Wickensee back in 1999. So that game, of course, continued bishop g7, queen d2, c6, f3. And as you can see, Topolov is taking the plan of expanding on the queen side. It's not really clear what else black should do here. If black doesn't expand on the queen side, he actually ends up getting in quite a bit of trouble in the center, which I'm going to show in... Um, a later game here that I'm going to show in this uh, same video. So we're going to have knight on g to e2, knight bd7, and Kasparov plays bishop h6. So this is one of the dangers of leaving your king in the middle for a little bit too long, is white will eventually just play bishop h6 and say, okay, well, now you kind of can't castle kingside. Um, if Topolov were to castle kingside right here, he would just be castling right into this kind of beginner mating attack, where white's going to continue with h4, h5, try to exchange on g6, exchange the dark sword bishop, and bring in the queen and the rook for mate. And this is just a little bit too easy for, for anybody to find, let alone somebody like Kasparov. So Topolov doesn't want to castle into that, so he just exchanges, and his basic plan was to bring his material out and then castle to the queen side. But as you can see, white has no problem transferring his pieces to the queen side because he's got decent control of the middle of the board, and this isn't an issue. And that's exactly what Kasparov does. He starts transferring his attack over to Topolov's queen side. So he brings his pieces over there. And meanwhile, Topolov starts uh, kind of going after the middle of the board. And after Topolov plays d5, Kasparov plays queen f4 here, and then Kasparov just again brings his pieces to the middle. Topolov basically just threatens to win the game strategically in the center of the board. He says, I'm just going to push you out of the middle of the board. And you're not going to have any place to put your pieces. And of course, this is where Kasparov did what Kasparov does. He comes up with a brilliant sacrifice to open up the position. He plays knight to d5, takes, takes, uh, queen d6, and then stop and pause the video and see if you can see Kasparov's idea. So if you found it, it was rook takes d4. It wasn't retreating the queen, losing a pawn, and then losing the center and losing the game, if that's what you were wondering. it was He actually had something in mind. So the idea is rook takes d4, and it, it's very difficult to uh, capture this rook, but Topolov didn't see anything better. Like, what well, he probably should have tried king b6 was definitely worth a shot, but he didn't play that, and it's hard to come up with these ideas during the game, so he actually just took it, and this was Kasparov's idea. He was going to continue the attack with a second rook sacrifice with rook e7. The point is the queen simply can't take this one. If queen takes rook, we're going to have queen take d4 check, king b8, queen b6, and then the point is this bishop is cutting off c8. So either you block with the queen and you lose your queen to the knight, or you block with the bishop, in which case it's mate in two to knight c6, king a8, queen a7 is mate. So he couldn't take the rook, so instead what he did was he played king to b6. Uh, we have queen d4 check, king a5, b4, king a4, queen c3, queen takes d5, rook a7. He has to prevent mate on c6, so the only move was bishop to b7. 
Rook b7, and now Topolov had one last chance to save, but this one was hard for anybody to see. I, I think I would have made the same mistake as Topolov. Uh, it's a very natural instinct when you're getting mated to, you know, go ahead, let's try to exchange queens. So Topolov's move queen c4 is just incredibly natural. It just happens to lose. Uh, the correct move uh, is also somewhat natural, but it, it would really take nerves of steel uh, with your king in a mating net like this. Uh, the correct move to save the game was actually rook hg8, and at least according to the engines, uh, this does save. So he had one last chance to save. But after queen c4, apparently this was Kasparov's game, and he you know finished it beautifully because that's what Kasparov does. Uh, he took the knight. Uh, he played this check, and then he finished him off with these very adorable uh, distance checks that all seemed to work. And then just this really great distraction move, uh, bishop f1, uh, just taking advantage of the fact that this king is in a mating net. All he really has to do is distract this queen. Uh, there's just too many threats that, that there's nothing that uh, black can apparently do. Like, he can't take this bishop, for instance. You know, you have queen c2 followed by queen, rook e7 is going to be mate. So there's just uh, basically nothing to do. So he plays rook d2 to try to mix things up. And then, of course, Kasparov has one last trick up his sleeve, you know, rook, rook d7, and the game is effectively over. So now rook takes, 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 and Topolov could resign right here, but he played like three more moves and then resigned. Uh, but this is just a winning position for white. The game is, of course, over. So that's how you play when they keep their king in the center for a little too long, expand on the queen side and try to castle queen side. So let's look at some other possible strategies. So this next game was played between Judith Polgar and uh, Christian Bauer, and it was uh, played in uh, 2001. This was a this was a rapid game, and uh, this game continued with uh, this early knight on b to d7. We have the same 150 attack setup, but this time black plays this uh, e5, and uh, apparently uh, black doesn't have any intention on playing g6 and bishop g7. Apparently black wants to play bishop e7, so this is another way to go. So... What usually happens in these types of positions is black just typically ends up being kind of weak in the middle, and that's kind of what happened here. Um, after c6, we have queen d2, we have castle's queen side, we have basically the same strategy. And then here's like the GM level uh, strategy that I was talking about. The main idea is to play g4, g5, kick this knight away from the middle of the board, and just basically say that you have an advantage in the middle. Um, so the game continued with b5. We had uh, king b1, knight b6, and then... We have queen e1 just kind of lining up that rook with the queen. Uh, you know, really, black has to do something about this. b4, knight on c to e2, uh, knight to c4, bishop back to c1. Uh, this is still just advantage white all day long. Uh, d5 got played, but this is very risky, especially when your queen is still lined up in the middle like this. But black just didn't want to get pushed out of the center um, against Judith. But d3, we have knight a3, bishop takes a3, b takes a3, d takes e5, and... Uh, black center is basically falling apart. So back we have pawn to f4, just advancing in the middle of the board. Bishop to g2, bishop g4, takes, takes, bishop takes. Uh, black center is completely gone. And we have, you know, strong pieces in the middle of the board. And actually this finished uh, rather quickly and rather brutally uh, for, for Judith, actually surprisingly quickly. So the game continued. Uh, rook c8, h3, kicking this bishop with tempo. Bishop f5, knight to c3, queen a5, knight on g to e2, and then once the attack on the king side got going, it just, uh, the game ended just so, so fast. Uh, queen to g3, the third is simply knight f6, so we have to come up with something. Uh, queen b7 didn't meet the threat. Knight f6 check, king h8, and then rook hg1 threatening rook takes, queen takes g7 mate. Uh, g6, queen h4 threatening queen h7 mate h5, and then we have queen g5, threatening queen h6, mate, <laughs> so king g7, and then we have rook to d7, hitting the queen, and threatening queen g6, but, I mean, there's nothing, rook c7, queen g6, check, and game over, so that's kind of what happens when black plays in the middle of the board, and that's kind of how you can approach it, is black just kind of ends up being a little bit weaker in the middle uh, than he would like. So this uh, next game we're going to take a look at is another Gary Kasparov game. This is kind of what you do if Black just kind of decides to uh, castle kingside, like Black didn't do in the Topolov game. Uh, we're going to have Black castle, and he's going to castle into this attack. So this is going to just kind of fall more down the line of just kind of a, a mainline Yugoslav attack. It's going to be very similar. White is just going to 
play bishop h6 at some point, play h4, h5, and just conduct his attack. So h4 gets played, h5 to slow the attack down, but that's okay, we can make some developing moves, and we can bring this knight back to b1, and now bishop h6, we're just going to go ahead and attack the, the black king. So we see this exchange, bishop e2, b4, knight a4, and g4, we're just going to blast open the king's side. You see, it works even for Kasparov. So it's like, you know, even Kasparov plays this way. And uh, just so now Kasparov is playing just like a 150 player or an 1800 player. It's essentially the same plan. If they put that plan on the table, you can go ahead and play this way if the castle king side. And this will probably be about 90% of your games if you're within that rating range. Like if you're around the 1800 range, you know, 90% of your games are going to look just like this. Um, so Rook H8, just trying to keep the position closed. Uh, then we have G5. So now we're back to the the grandmaster level strategy where we kick the knight away from the critical D5 square. And now uh, the, the the attack just continues to roll um, towards the black king and it all is going to fall apart uh, fairly fairly soon uh, everything is just going to come after that king notice the king just has to get off this diagonal we're threatening moves like d5 just getting our, our queen is already on the dark squares so you know we have to do something but then it's really easy to open the position at this point just f5 rook a7 and yeah the whole position is just going to open up against the black king and this is hopeless after knight g6 i mean he could probably just resign right now but he played uh i guess one more move i don't know and uh queen d3 knight f5 queen f5 check and now finally black resigns it's over um it's going to be mate in, in two so like king g7 queen f6 king h7 queen f6 is going to be mate so this next game that we're going to look at is an anand game this was anand versus uh Smirin, played back in 1994 so this is going to be like a slightly different strategy this is going to be the black king just stays in the middle so we've seen the king castle queen side we've seen the king castle uh king side in this case we're just going to see this king uh just kind of stay straight in the middle um and we're going to see how that goes so after e4 d6 and again white plays the 150 attack but this time uh we expand on the queen side and then after castle's queen side uh we have bishop g7 but notice that the black king hasn't really castled yet so this is kind of very similar to what topolov was doing and, you know, against Topolov, what Kasparov did was he played this early uh, bishop h6 to try to, you know, get Topolov to eventually make the decision to castle queenside. In this case, Anand is just a little bit more um, straightforward. He just says, you know, hey, do what you want to do. If you keep the king in the middle of the board like this, all I really need to do is just exchange in the middle and plop my queen down on d6. Um, so, so this is kind of interesting. Uh, it, it's possible that that queen d6 wasn't like a hundred percent the best move like what was probably the best move was just g4 g5 uh black has just kind of run out of places to put his pieces here and if you play g4 like according to the computer the best move is probably just to castle right away and you're going to be walking right into a winning attack like white's going to have a winning attack at that point after g4 but if black doesn't castle right away after say g5 knight h5 and then queen d6 Black's position is nearly uh, hopeless. It's almost impossible to defend it. So it's kind of a catch-22 here. But okay, so queen d6 was good. g4 was probably better um, and probably went in even faster. But queen d6 was good. Uh, bishop b7, so this is the point. We, we attack c6, so we're gaining tempo. King b1, and then he castled queenside. So this is a common theme. We saw this in the Topolov game as well, where black gets stuck in the middle uh, for too long and then he finally decides to evacuate to the queen side, but the queen side is not really a very safe place when you've already played these expansion moves. And of course, we saw in the Polgar game, without these expansion moves, we end up getting in trouble as well. So we have uh, queen e7, rook f8, knight c1, uh, and now we finally have this g4, g5 plan, also in conjunction with knight b3, and then this was the main thing that caused him all kinds of headaches after knight c5, white's position is basically winning. Uh, black's king queen side is falling apart and the center is falling apart so now rookie seven uh bishop takes b5 and the whole queen side just collapses uh this very easy sacrifice uh knight c5 bishop here and yeah it looks kind of ugly but what was there that was better um you can't uh take back you know this knight is going to be coming in with a uh, brutal tempo and then you can't even move your queen because we either have some sort of check with this other knight we have attacks on a7 we have stuff coming to d6 so there's just too much stuff uh coming into this position so he, he simplified in the best way he maybe could 
And then he tried to uh, just kind of block things up, but it just ends up being very simple for White. He just wins this whole pawn and keeps it and then starts bringing more pieces into the attack uh, yet again. The attack didn't stop uh, just because a little bit of material got off the board. And then he just simplifies into a, a completely winning position very easily. Uh, knight c5 takes and just some brutal tactics here. <laughs> knight d5, very good find. And uh, now the rest of the material goes away. Anand is up like mountain of pawns here. You know, three pawns. More importantly, this king is very weak and white's king is actually quite safe. So black tries to drum up something against the king. Anand decides that he can let his king get a little bit unsafe for a second or two just to allow his last two pieces to get into the assault. And uh, it's basically over. After this check, we have rook b3, and white's king is still very, very safe, but now this pawn is going to make a new queen, and that's going to basically be the end of the game. So those are the things that you can possibly face uh, when you play the 150 attack, and that's how you play against all those different scenarios. You know, black can play in the middle of the board, black can play on the queen side, black can play on the king side, and if you're playing the 150 attack, um, the nice thing about it is your strategy is usually going to be about the same. You're going to, you know, just play f3, bishop e3, uh, queen d2, castles queen side, and then you're either going to play g4, g5 and just kick the knight out of the middle, or you're going to play for mate if they castled king side. Um, and if they castled queen side and expanded over there, you might play king b1, knight of gd2, knight c1, knight b3. But for the most part, it's really just minor variations on what amounts to the same plan. So anyway, so that's how to play the 150 attack against the perk. Um, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess. Uh, thank you very much for watching.